Hello, everyone. My name is Mary Rose, and I'll be your host for today's webcast, Unix Security, Stop Leaving Your Most Sensitive Assets and Credentials at Risk. Our CyberArk security experts, Jamar Tang and Brad Brown, will be presenting today's topic, which addresses the security related to Unix and Linux accounts that contain privileges. They'll explain how admins can easily access systems while ensuring the security of high-value assets and privileged accounts. I am recording this webinar, and I will make a link available to all of you within the next few days. Um, and we will be taking questions at the end of the webinar, so just uh, be sure to enter your questions into the Q&A panel. Good idea to put them in there while you're thinking of them, and we will um, address them right at the end. So, Jay, I'm sure everyone is ready to get started, so I'm going to go ahead and hand things over to you. Great. Awesome. <clears throat> this is a quick check. Can you hear me okay? Yes, I can. Awesome. Great. So great. Thank you. Thank you so much, Mary. Good morning, good, good, good afternoon to everyone on the line. This is Jay Martang speaking. Uh, I'm a senior solutions engineer with CyberArk, and I'm joined by Brad Brown, who is one of CyberArk's regional directors. We're both out here uh, on the West Coast, so specifically Southern California. So if you are ever out here, please feel free to look us up, hit us up on LinkedIn. Uh, we love hearing from customers as well as prospects to talk about uh, the security initiatives and challenges. Uh, as Mary mentioned, we're going to be discussing some of the risk exposed on the Unix Linux side when proper precautions are not taken into account. We'll discuss some of the challenges, the solution, and show a quick before and after demo of how CyberArk can play a role in your organization. Now, if you're not familiar at all with CyberArk, we are in the business of privilege account management and security and making sure that there are proper controls in place for these critical accounts given the nature of how they can be used and or abused in an environment. Now, uh, you probably joined the, the webcast here to talk, you know, because you're interested in Unix and Linux. And when it comes to Unix and Linux, we can say a lot of things. Uh, it's been around forever, and it's notoriously um, noted for being incredibly flexible and incredibly reliable. Uh, as a result, many organizations entrust these systems with their most sensitive and business critical applications, which in turn means security should be a consideration. Uh, we typically see organizations run their databases and corporate websites on Linux OSs, but, but uh, the use is really varied by industry vertical. So whether you're Jurassic Park, right, locking up the dinosaurs, or as we see in the real world, financial trading platforms are often powered by Linux, industrial control systems and their HMIs are often powered by Unix, and even the United States Department of Defense recently migrated the majority of their infrastructure to Red Hat. Now, these aren't everyday systems that, if compromised, could result in a little bit of damage. These are systems that typically power your most sensitive and critical assets, and if compromised, the consequences could be severe, and in the worst case, you know, result in a loss of life. Uh, now, if you've seen any of the recent news, you probably have already heard about the Yahoo breach, and we can add this to the list of growing breaches that occur year over year. Uh, just recently, some more details were released regarding what transpired, and the U.S. Department of Justice is indicting four individuals who are allegedly involved in the incident. Now, while we don't have 100% of the facts, what we do know is that the attackers gained a foothold just one of the individuals who worked for Yahoo in order to act on their objectives. This initial entry into the Yahoo network ultimately led the attackers to specific administrative tools, as well as a user database which contained a cryptographic nonce of each account, which ultimately let the attackers forge cookies to falsify identities and get access to email. The U.S. Department of Justice also elaborated on the fact that the compromised accounts included Russian and U.S. government officials. Now, even with limited knowledge, what was released seems to follow a trend which we see in many breaches time and time again. First things first is that there needs to be initial foothold into that environment. Now, this can happen in many different ways. If you have many external facing web servers, for example, one of these servers might be targeted for a web shell exploit. Uh, especially if these servers are not kept up to date with the latest patches. Or, in the case of Yahoo and many others, it may start with a phishing email. Why? Because phishing works. All it takes is one. 
Uh, and an organization of 40,000, for example, all it takes is one and then it can grow from there. Um, the idea of a wall perimeter is pretty much done. People are the new perimeter and the ultimate way in. Now, I can't see any of you folks because we're here virtually, but if I ask how many of you have a Facebook and or a LinkedIn profile, I'd be willing to bet I'd get about 90% of you to raise your hand, if not all of you. Uh, attackers will always do reconnaissance on the people in your network, and what we see is that often attackers glean what type of role the person plays uh, in an organization by what's hosted on their social media account. So why not make those individuals a target for phishing or spear phishing? Once in, attackers will see what they can find on their machine, which many times includes password hashes or even saved SSH keys, which will allow them to move laterally. And naturally, complex passwords, especially SSH keys, are hard to remember and a little too long to write down, so we'll keep them locally on our machine somewhere. Uh, management of these keys can also be a painful administrative task, so we've seen organizations use the same key for a majority of their servers. If and when these keys are found, attackers will continue to move around until they find the right machine that has access to the target and the end goal. Now, when these systems are compromised and breaches occur, it causes long-term pain. Two recent examples of brute exploits really highlight just what can be done when attackers gain access to critical Unix and Linux systems. Uh, the first incident was against two separate utility companies in Ukraine. Uh, this massive breach involved the complete compromise of Windows-based IT systems as well as Unix-based control systems. Uh, when the final stage of the attack was executed, about 225,000 residents were left without electricity, and the majority of IT systems were completely overridden. Even months down the road after the attacks, operators still had to drive to power plants uh, you know, to manually control and update the systems. Uh, another example is a media company who fell victim to target attackers and lost complete control of their IT environment. Uh, in this case, it was compromised passwords and SSH keys. Uh, they were used to access and significantly damage all of their systems to the point where they decided it was easy just to rebuild a second IT environment from scratch, which estimated uh, that project was to take about a year, right? Now, personally, in my prior life, I've been involved with organizations that were part of a supply chain in which their information was targeted due to the partners that they specifically did business with. So it really requires us to understand what about our businesses are unique? What type of information do we hold that might be viable to a threat actor? Uh, what is the potential long-term impact if something does happen? And given the fact, as I mentioned earlier, how many critical systems could be and are hosted on Unix and Linux systems, we want to make sure that security is a high priority. But then, how do we do that dance? How do we tread the thin line with security on one side and convenience on the other? How can we be secure while being operationally efficient? Is it possible? Or is it just really painful? And I would argue that you can indeed have your cake and eat it too with the use of a tool like CyberArk, right? And this is where CyberArk comes into play. It all starts with discovery. You don't know what you don't know. Uh, what we would first want to do is get an understanding of your risk footprint. Discover the SSH keys. Where are they? What do they have access to? And even get a visual so that if we see that one SSH key or root account is compromised, for example, where could the lateral movement occur afterwards? Right? And to help with securing those accounts, CyberArk offers a centralized platform to manage and control privileged account access from one central location. So this includes AD bridging capabilities, which enable seamless authentication for all Unix users that are in Active Directory. Securing and managing uh, passwords and SSH keys is really at the heart of it here, right? And it takes place in the secure digital vault. The solution stores, secures, rotates, and protects access to these critical credentials in line with policy requirements whether those requirements are mandated internally or if the organization is mandated through some specific type of compliance regulation. Uh, since we have a complete audit trail of these accounts, when audit time comes along, you can provide the complete activity of your privileged accounts in the environment because they're stored in a central location. 
Uh, it's often critical for organizations to limit privileges. And while some organizations do this with pseudo, uh, this is not a centralized solution. It can be a little bit of a burden. Um, cyber art can enforce the least privileged policies from a central management platform, as well as tailor the privilege that a specific account has, which I'll show you in a few minutes. Now, I've mentioned critical assets several times throughout the discussion so far. Uh, but we, what we also need to be aware of is the privileged sessions that are connecting to them. Uh, we'll want to make sure we can monitor and record these sessions, and I'll explain that here in a minute, so I'm going to show that for now. But ultimately, uh, in an environment that is completely being managed and monitored, we'll end up establishing a baseline of what is normal. What exactly is known good inside the environment? Well, once we know what good behavior is, we can detect behavior that deviates from that known good. And that's when we'll want to alert ourselves so that we can take action. So from a wide perspective, CyberArk can assist you in every part of the journey, from first understanding your risk to helping, to helping get control of that risk by locking up the privileged accounts, and then ultimately moving to a point where we can alert ourselves and um, monitor for anomalous behavior. So I mentioned I want to talk a little bit more about isolation and monitoring, and this is where we get into the privilege session manager component of CyberArk. Our goal with privilege session manager is to be secure but still be operationally efficient. So what exactly are we going to do in order to accomplish that? Well, first, we're going to isolate critical assets through the use of a secure jump server. That jump server will also monitor and record these privileged sessions so that they're able to be reviewed at a later point in time. We also want to be able to provide a native experience for our Unix Linux users. So the workflow is as follows. I'll connect as a vault user of CyberArk, specifically, um, you know, my identity. Uh, specify the account I'm looking to use. Specify the target. I'm looking to log on to, and route it through the Drum server. Privilege Session Manager brokers that connection, retrieves the account from the digital vault, and uses it to log on to the target asset, whether it's an operating system, a database server, application, whichever. And to the user, it's a seamless connection. So what's important with this type of a setup? Well, for starters, we're creating a buffer. We're not going to allow any malware to directly be able to access the target asset. Additionally, we're never once seeing or compromising that password because the management of that password or SSH key is being handled through CyberArk. So with that, I'm going to switch over to the environment and we'll show you a quick demo uh, before and after of some of the risk um, that can exist today and how it would change with CyberArk in place. All right. So uh, here, right, I am going to be playing the role of a user within an organization. Uh, to set the stage here, um, Threat Action has already done reconnaissance on the org. They found me specifically because of uh, either whom I do business with or maybe they can uh, infer what I had access to. They've crafted a very unique phishing email that looks legitimate. I've fallen for it, I clicked, clicked the link, um, got redirected to a compromised website, there's cross-site surfing attack, I'm victim of a drive-by download, and now I have some malware on my computer. Now, as the user, I am authenticating with SSH keys. Because it's an SSH key, and as you can see here, there's no way I'm going to remember this, I'm saving it locally, and I'm using it as a private party key file here on my desktop. Now, the threat actor, once he installs the malware, What's he going to want to do? He's going to want to get shell access. Now, with shell access, again, you know, that gives a lot of options to what he can do. So, but first, what he's going to do is actually run a search to see, are there any private putty key files on the system? So, he's going to run a quick search. That's going to go through. Jackpot. He found what he wanted. And he knows that there's an SSH key here that will get him root access on Red Hat 2. So he'll change the directory. 
And what he's going to do is now take that SSH key and log on to that Red Hat machine and get root access. So what we're seeing here is some risk exposed on the desktop. He's found the SSH key. Now he's root on the Red Hat machine. Now he can do enough damage as root uh, on this machine as it is, but in reality, that's not his end objective. What he wants to do is get onto the database hosted on this machine. So he's going to switch over to the Oracle user. And he's going to log on to SQL Plus. And he's going to connect as his DBA. So now he's on. And at this point, he can pretty much kind of take a look at what's hosted on this machine, hosted in this database. Now you can imagine, right, this database can be pretty much anything. In the case of Yahoo, right, perhaps maybe I'm looking for that specific nut because I want to create those cookies. Maybe this is a database hosting PCI type of information, credit card numbers. Maybe it's hosting PHI from a HIPAA perspective if you're involved in healthcare. I mean, it really can be anything. The point I'm driving at here is that by having an SSH key exposed, you can escalate to root, and then you can even escalate to something else if you don't have the proper controls in place. What are those controls, and how does that look different with Cyber can play? So let's close this. Let's close this. Let's make my machine clean again. And let's take a look at what a workflow with CyberArk would be like. So if with CyberArk and say users would immediately off the bat, like there would not be any use for SSH keys uh, hosted locally because all SSH keys, root accounts, et cetera, would be hosted inside this digital vault. Now before I can get access to that digital vault, what I'm going to want to do is make sure that I authenticate the users coming in. Why? Well, because CyberArk is hosting the keys to the kingdom, we want to make sure these users are who they say they are. So you can see we can integrate with different uh, two-factor authentication solutions and highly recommend that. Additionally, what we can do is leverage the roles in Active Directory to tailor the access to which keys and which person has access to which keys and which accounts, for example. So I can log on here as Paul. So Paul is the Linux admin. And you can see here, I'll be brought to all Unix Linux-based accounts because I'm a Unix Linux admin, right? Now, if I need to install some software on Red Hat Zoom, for example, I can click here on this little connect button and connect through Privilege Session Manager. This is where Privilege Session Manager comes into play here. I'm going to open up a connection to Red Hat 2, and without even looking at the root password, you can see here my session is going to be recorded. I haven't even seen the root password yet. I am root on Red Hat 2. Furthermore, you can see that I logged on, right? We logged on as a logon account, right? So perhaps you don't want to have direct SSH root log on through, uh, you know, through a through SSH session. You can use a logon account because CyberHawk has access to that root password. We can just leverage that and switch user from here, okay? Now I can do whatever I need to do. Um, Right, maybe make another config change. Uh, uh, right, I can even, you know, blah, 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 et cetera, et cetera. But, right, um, and I can close my session from here. Right, and the same workflow would, would uh, occur if I was uh, connecting with an SSH key, for example. Now, I know I mentioned before, I mentioned a native uh, experience, right? So what does that look like? Well, I can open up Putty here, so perhaps I love using Putty, right? I've been using it for years. I'm sure all of you have as well. And I can uh, load my connection string here, and you can see I'm going to be logged in as Paul. I'm going to be requesting root. I'm going to be connecting to my target and routing through the proxy server here. Now, I'm going to log on as, uh, as Paul, and I don't know the root password, but I do know Paul's password. Paul's going to log on. And this session is going to be recorded. And here I am, again, as root. All right, find out where I am. Again, I'm going to just issue a command here. Oh, maybe I fat fingered it. I did. It'd be nice if I actually spelled it right. <laughs> now, what did I do before, right? I was mentioning, you know, we have, I'm on as root. I can do whichever I need to do. But at the same time, if I was going to try and 
switch over to that Oracle user, maybe I want to muck around or something, well, guess what? I can't. Privilege Session Manager has blocked that command. So you can see here, I've actually taken privilege away from the root user because Paul, as the Linux Unix admin, doesn't need to be getting onto the database. That's what we have the DBAs for, right? So what would their workflow be like? Well, I can close this. I could sign out. I can switch hats. I can log in as Robert, who is the database admin, right? And because Robert is part of the DBA uh, group in Active Directory, he has only access to the database account. And he can connect here, right, the same way through Privilege Session Manager to SQL Plus. He can use that SysDBA account, load up that connection, make sure that that connection is being recorded, being keystrokes, all, the, you know, et cetera, all of the above, and still get that native experience, right? And, uh, you know, maybe he wants to alter user, for example, et cetera, he goes about his day, and there you go, right? He said and done, and he can finish his work. Now, we've had two different users here uh, do what they were doing, but as I mentioned before, Privilege Session Manager is actually recording these sessions and brokering the connection. So what does it look like from an overall auditing perspective when you want to go back in and take a look exactly what happened? So the last hat I'm going to use here is that of Mike. Mike is a Vault admin inside the environment. And you can see when Mike logs on, because he's a Vault admin, he has access to the account that we store here in CyberArk. He also has uh, some more options up here, right? He can tweak the password policy, for example. Maybe he uh, wants to change the automatic times that passwords are changed. But more importantly, he wants to go in and take a look at those sessions, right? Now, he can generically search for all videos inside the environment and show everything, right? But maybe he's looking for sessions only on that Red Hat machine, right? And he wants to pull up uh, Paul session, right? And you can see here, here is actually the command list uh, because everything was being recorded, what, what happened when. Now, if I wanted to go in and take a look at a specific time when I issued a command, I can hit that play button, and I immediately am brought to when that happens uh, on the screen. Right? And it doesn't really matter if it's, if it's that or uh, any of the from before to, I can just go in and take a look. So from an overall perspective, right, to summarize what we've shown before we go to questions, let's, let's discuss what we've seen. We've seen how easy it is to search for an SSH key and authenticate to a server as the privilege root account. We then escalated our privilege further by pivoting from the root user to the Oracle database user, and from there, we can act on our objectives. However, with a privileged account security solution in play, We've mitigated our risk of rogue SSH keys because they're all being managed inside the vault. We've gained an audit trail and isolated high value assets while still allowing our Unix Linux admins to get their work done. And we've also included a way to implement least privilege based on job roles. So with that, I'm going to switch it over to Brad and we're going to hit some of the questions that may have come up during this, uh, the webinar thus far. Excellent, thank you, Jay. Great job there. Can you hear me okay? Yes. Awesome. So we have a few questions in the queue. I'll go ahead and, and just uh, read these off. If anybody else has questions, feel free to put them into the queue. Uh, the first question is, does CyberArk offer least privileged solution for Linux and Unix? Uh, so yeah, Jay touched on that. It's called, it's called on-demand privileges for Linux and Unix. Again, it's meant to be a pseudo replacement with a centralized policy that's in the vault rather than having to reside on every system. Uh, so it's a nice way to be able to, at a glance and at a click, add and remove users and groups and commands and command groups to a policy uh, to allow that least privileged model. Uh, next question is, uh, we have a lot of automation in our environment. Can I programmatically access passwords and SSH keys? Uh, absolutely, you can. So we have a fully extensible API that comes in several flavors. So whether you're doing development in Java, uh, want to make a command line call, integrate with a cron job or an actual application, 
you do have the ability to pull back credentials and SSH keys and pass those along to a, a job for automation without ever exposing the credential or the SSH key itself. Uh, what else do we have here? A couple questions on um, architecture. So basically the architecture of CyberArk is we have the digital vault at the core of our technology and we want to make that highly available and uh, set up disaster recovery with that. Again, as Jay mentioned, we're holding the keys to your kingdom, right? So we want to make sure that this solution is mission critical and is treated as such, and we want to put all those proper controls in place. Uh, from there, we can spin up multiple instances of our web portal, of our uh, proxy servers, of the servers that go out and change the passwords. From there, if we want to, we can even scale to a, uh, a global geographical sort of a model as well. So we have multiple customers who are global in nature, and they have pieces of CyberArk solution uh, in each of those locations so that if I'm in EMEA, I'm not having to traverse a WAN link to change passwords and access systems uh, in the U.S. I would simply hit those resources in the U.S. to gain access to that. Any more color you want to add to that, Jay? Uh, no, I mean you pretty much pretty much hit all the uh, the points there to that. Um, okay. Yeah, streaming is the way to go. So I have another question here about one click to connect. So we did see examples that Jay showed uh, going into the web portal and clicking a connect button to get access to whatever kind of account on whatever kind of endpoint that we're managing that credential on. Um, a couple of points to note. Jay did show accessing a Linux or Unix system through PuTTY, a native tool from my desktop without ever having to hit the web portal. We also offer uh, RDP proxy, so from my Windows box, I can launch those sessions from my desktop tool, authenticate to the vault, and still get a proxied session through our privilege session management server. So we can absolutely uh, handle that for you as well. And that's a lot of my nice benefit. Um, if there are current customers on the line, you'll need to upgrade to version 9.8 to get that functionality of RDP proxy. It looks like that's about all of the questions that have come into the queue. Let me just check back one more time here. I'll check the chat window as well. So I, I think we are good, Mary, on this end for uh, Q&A. Okay, great, thank you. Awesome presentation. Uh, just a reminder to everybody, we'll get a link to this recording out to you, hopefully by end of week. And uh, do take a look at our main homepage for the On the Front Lines. It's just cyrock.com slash OTFL. We've added a couple of new sessions. A um, few of them to highlight is uh, we have something coming up with our, our partner, SailPoint, and we'll be showing a joint integration on how we integrate with the SailPoint technology. And that will be a live demo, so that's something you might want to see for folks that are interested in, in both of those technologies. And on May 23rd, we're having a live session with our red team, and they're going to demonstrate a live attack and then open it up for like an Ask Me Anything type webinar. So um, just some different things coming up there that you might be interested in. So I guess that's it for today. I wanted to say thank you to both Jay and Brad and also everybody for taking, you know, half an hour out of your day today to join us. And we hope to see you here next Tuesday. Thanks, everybody. Bye now.